Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another session of SACPA. During this time of social and physical distancing, SACPA believes it's important to keep engaging with the public on issues of the day. And in order to do so, we are very thankful for the continuing support we receive from the University of Lethbridge, Shaw Spotlight, and the Lethbridge Herald. Today, we have with us Dr. Gordon Holden on the topic of Canada-China relations, can the relationship be saved? Dr. Gordon Holden is the director of the China Institute, professor of political science and adjunct professor of the Alberta School of Business at the University of Alberta. Professor Holden joined the Canadian Foreign Service in 1976, serving in Ottawa and abroad. 22 of these years in the Canadian Foreign Service were spent working on Chinese economic trade and political affairs for the government of Canada, including five postings in China. He also served at the Canadian embassies in Havana and Warsaw and at Canada National Defence College. His last assignment before joining the University of Alberta was as Director General of the East Asian Bureau of the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade responsible for Greater China, Japan, the Koreas, and Mongolia. Under Professor Holden's leadership, the China Institute has focused on contemporary China, China studies with an emphasis on Canada's trade, investment, and energy linkages with the PRC and Asian security issues. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, and we look very much forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much, Annalise, for your kind introductory words. And I also would like to thank the, the sponsors, uh, and in particular, of course, the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs. Um, I have a, a view that foreign affairs are too left simply to Ottawa, the national government, that the Canadian public and institutions all across our country need to be aware of developments and to be very much um, um, in the in the know on, on on political affairs, foreign policy generally, and China is certainly an important part of that. The um, subtitle is meant uh, to provoke a bit. Can this relationship be saved? The view is that the relationship will exist in one form or the other. The question is, what form will it be? Let's look at the next slide. And you'll see here that I have divided things into the economic and, and we'll later be looking at the political issues. Um, but the economic context is important. Why do we care about China? Why is China so powerful? It's because of China's economic success. And if you look at the next slide, uh, you will see the reason why. Uh, that GDP growth rates um, peaking um, as high as, as uh, 14, almost 15 percent uh, in this uh, in the early part of the century. And quite frankly, um, the there were times in the 1980s when China's economic modernization, launched by party strongman Deng Xiaoping, was just getting underway. There were rates of economic growth that approached uh, almost 20 percent. Now you will see a drop off in the growth rates as you get deeper into the first two decades of this century. However, it's a little bit uh, there's a little bit of an illusion there. While the rate of growth has been slowing over the last five to 10 years. The reality is that the Chinese economy is now so large that even a modest growth rate of say five or 6%, modest by Chinese standards, not modest by Western standards, represents a huge piece of growth of the global economy. In other words, the bigger the pie, even at a lower rate of increase, the amount of total GDP growth. The very uh, right hand side of the slide, you'll see that sharp drop off caused by COVID-19, the pandemic in which we are dealing with right now. I was in Beijing during the SARS epidemic at our embassy in 2003, um, but this, because it covered more intensely China and led to a sharper shutdown of Chinese society, led also to a, a sharper decline in the, in the GDP growth in 2020. However, 
while the economy of China uh, contracted in the second quarter by um, somewhere between 5 and 10 percent, which is an extraordinarily high level, because partly because China had done such a thorough job of shutting down the country. The reality is that in the third quarter, there's been what they call, economists call a V-shaped recovery, a pretty sharp rebound. And China will, um, at the end of this year, estimates range somewhere between 1 and 2 percent net growth for the entire year. Um, that will contrast with that with the United States. Estimates are um, a negative growth of 3 percent, roughly. Uh, the EU at 4.3 percent, and for Canada, 4.6 percent. So while we are stuck in the doldrums, still struggling, uh, China is on a rebound track, and that has really significant implications. If you are a commodity exporter, however, and that certainly is Canada, China is now the single largest importer of petroleum, the single largest, well, they take almost half of the world's production of iron ore, copper, many other uh, minerals and metals. Uh, that means that the Chinese recovery is actually sustaining global pricing. If China were to be experiencing the same level of decline uh, as Canada and the United States right now, uh, that would have profound and very negative impact for commodities. So for the global economy, at least, a Chinese recovery is good news. We'll now look at the next slide, um, Chinese investment in Canada. I'm not going to spend much time on this. This was a very controversial subject, particularly in the around 2012, 2013, when China purchased Nexen Petroleum for $15 billion Canadian, roughly. This was, at the time, the largest ever Chinese purchase abroad. A subsidy had been one, Syngenta, which was almost triple that. Uh, but you can also see a declining rate of increase. There's reasons for that. The fact that Canada turned down several deals. It's expensive to make a merger and acquisition, uh, to enter a merger and acquisition process. As well, China's been cutting back on its own uh, export of FDI. There were, there were significant issues of corruption on the Chinese side, which the party is cracking down on. For this basket of reasons, uh, that um, decline in investment in Canada is, is significant. Now, the China Institute keeps, in my view, China Institute, the University of Alberta, the best statistics on Chinese investment in Canada. We keep tracking that. We've been doing that um, for the last 10 years, and our numbers go right back to 1993. Um, and you can see the the overall impact of that, and that uh, China is well behind uh, other countries, particularly the United States and Europe, in terms of overall investment. But it's very skewed regionally. You can see that um, almost two thirds of the investment is in Alberta. That's because of those huge energy investments made um, eight to ten years ago. Uh, those have dried up. The new investment coming into Canada from China largely flows to. BC and Ontario, but the deals are much smaller. If you're building a warehouse, if you're buying a commercial property, if you're investing in a small IT factory or you're um, putting together a glass factory in Ontario, as happened recently, those numbers are not nearly as large as if you're buying an uh, oil or gas uh, consortium or property. Those are, by definition, energy investments are huge. Mining is still a significant investment. Um, some of those places that aren't shown in the other category include some investments in base metals and gold in the northern, in, in the Yukon Northwest Territories, but they pale in size, the investment of into Alberta uh, several years ago. And quite frankly, the ramp of Chinese investment in Canada has slowed down significantly, and I think it will not recover immediately, particularly with the political woes, which we'll get to a bit later. Here we have the, um, the trade figures. Um, if you ran those back all the way back into the 1980s, there was actually a time when we exported more than we imported from Canada. Um, but the numbers wouldn't even show on that scale uh, because the Chinese economy has grown so quickly and so massively, the trade figures were very tiny. And before the Chinese economic reform, which began in 1978, the trade was minuscule. So that period from when we recognized China 1970 until 1978, even 1980, you could say, uh, Chinese economy is a very poor place, large place, yes, in terms of, of area, almost the same size as Canada, 
uh, but with an economy that was um, very much third world. And China had the largest pool of poor people on earth. But it's certainly not the case now uh, where uh, Chinese income, very unevenly distributed, um, is very large. Now, these trade figures, one thing that might be a bit surprising, there in 2018 and 2019, since the crisis began with Meng Wanzhou and our two Michaels, um, you can see that trade has remained relatively stable. In fact, our figures so far for this year that we track with the aid of, of course, the Statistics Canada um, and the Chinese Ministry of Commerce show that trade will be up slightly um, between Canada and China. That's not the case for most of our trading partners because their economies have been slowed by COVID. So again, that relatively buoyant economy, that the trade relationship has not been as severely impacted by the political problems as we might have thought is, is notable. Yes, canola has been badly hit, but uh, looking at the most recent stats for the third quarter, canola seed uh, is up significantly uh, as are exports of beef, the Chinese, and pork. Chinese really prefer pork, well, almost all foodstuffs except perhaps seafood. Uh, their pork herd, national pork herd, was, has, was devastated by swine flu, by swine fever uh, over the course of the last year plus. It was almost all had to be destroyed, and so uh, pork imports have been huge and are growing. This is significant, and again, that's why it's not easy to um, uh, pay attention uh, to, to, to not pay attention to China. Next slide. Um, and uh, here we have, just a moment, Chinese investment by region and Chinese trade. I'll go straight forward onto the slide, Alberta trade with China. And the Alberta trade um, had took a, start, a sharp dip um, in our exports. You can see that 2018, 2019, that's entirely canola. Some billion dollars of canola trade that was basically stopped. Um, but the levels have not collapsed completely. Um, our imports from of our in this province from remain more, more or less flat. We're one of the provinces that has a net trade uh, surplus with China in a good year. And I believe that when we look at 2020, it will show considerable growth in exports to China because of the return of some canola sales and because of the um, return of, of uh, beef and pork trade. Alberta is exports 80% of the country's beef. Uh, China, Chinese are not as much beef consumers as pork consumers, but it is significant. When you have 1.4 billion population, even modest trade can be significant. Now I'm going to um, turn to the political context. And the political relationship has been particularly fraught uh, over the, since December of 2018, when Canada detained the CFO, uh, the Chief Financial Officer, Meng Wanzhou of, of Huawei. And significant, particularly significant, is that the CFO is the daughter of the founder, Chairman Ren of, the, of Huawei Corporation. Uh, that makes her a, one could almost say a princess in terms of the political constellation in China. Chairman Ren, um, head of China's most successful international corporation, um, certainly has the ability to contact the Chinese hierarchy. So by taking the daughter, detaining the daughter of, on a U.S. extradition request, um, we were immediately in hot water. And to... Um, um, I'll go to the next slide. Um, uh, these two individuals uh, have a major role. Of course, immediately following the detention of, of um, uh, Madame Meng, just days later, two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, um, one from Alberta, one a former officer of the Department of Foreign Affairs who I had met, uh, have been detained, held in difficult conditions uh, and for almost two years almost two years. I saw them recently, but for a very long time, allegedly because of COVID, they were denied visitors. They get a once a month visit 
from the Canadian Embassy, and that contrasts sharply with conditions for Madame Monk, who is under, um, not even under house arrest, she uh, has to stay in one of her residences at, at night, but wears an ankle bracelet and is able to receive friends and to shop and go out, uh, of course, within the limitations of COVID, uh, but the conditions contrast sharply. Here we have a, the both Canadian leader and the Chinese leader. On the Chinese side, I believe that there were very, very high ex expectations for the relationship under Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, the political arrangements had been made, the diplomatic recognition on October 13th, 1970, by Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Trudeau, and the, who had been written books about China, traveled in China, and had really forged that relationship, which had been budding, but never quite completed until 1970 under the previous Prime, Prime Minister's leadership. Xi Jinping, arguably the most powerful Chinese leader since, some would say since Mao, I would say since Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, who is really putting his own stamp, more conservative, um, um, certainly more internal controls, crack down on dissidents and on, uh, on some of the religious minorities. We'll get into that a little bit later. On the other hand, definitely expanding China's economic presence abroad, uh, growing the Chinese military. China's beginning to act as a great power. One of Deng Xiaoping's sayings, one of many, uh, was hide your strength, uh, bide your time. And arguably, China's time has now arrived. It is true that China's GDP is out of the United States, depending how you measure it. However, the Chinese economic pace uh, and the slowed American econo economy, particularly now in the, in the, uh, with COVID, I think that those, those two events, sustained Chinese recovery, China, American faltering, American economy faltering under COVID, that will accelerate the time where China will have the largest economy on earth. Um, it's in the cards. And I'll just give you one little statistic why I believe China is in a position to continue its growth. China now graduates twice as many um, university graduates each year, but five times as many STEM graduates, so science, technology, engineering, and medicine. Uh, that's a torrent of, of graduates. Now, the quality on average may not be as high in the United States, probably is not high, but the elite institutions in China are very, very good. And that, I believe, is a potent force for Chinese onward economic expansion. They also pay very close attention and fund heavily uh, research, s and and their universities and colleges are skewed so much toward, so somewhat towards uh, the hard sciences and the applied sciences, and that can have an economic benefit. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, I've already touched upon the key figures that have, in effect, been the ruination of the current state of Canada-China economic relations. Meng Wanzhou there on, um, on, your, on your left. Um, she is, was transiting through Canada, as you probably all know. Um, the warrant was waiting, a warrant issued uh, in the summer by the Eastern District Court of, um, of New York, um, held uh, as a sealed indictment by the American Department of Justice, conveyed to the Canadian government once the American government became aware of and amongst travel plans, which would take her through through Canada. And then the Canadian government acted on that, on that extradition warrant. And of course, that court proceedings are still going forward two years later. Uh, certainly will not be resolved uh, in this calendar year. Perhaps in the next calendar year, that would depend on, on the issues of appeals, whether the new U.S. administration sustains the uh, extradition request, and whether once the proceedings are finished, the Canadian government proceeds with an actual extradition, or if the Minister of Justice, it's within his powers, chooses to bring the proceedings to an end. We will see. And I don't have a crystal ball. There have been already several twists and turns in that. And of course, one factor will be, will the extradition judge Matt among to extradition? Um, that we will see um, the judges keeping their views to themselves. So the judges and officials are keeping their views to themselves. The Matt among is a very strong defense team. The Crown has cracked crack lawyers, prosecutors. We'll see how that works out. Again, I wanted to show the photos of the two Canadians. 
Uh, my thoughts are with them. Uh, they are safe. I think that China's done a good job of preventing COVID from entering the, the jails. I don't know that with precisely, but their conditions, again, are, are very tough and their families are having a hard time. Uh, I've included on the um, on your far right, uh, Robert Schellenberg. This is someone, um, I will make a distinction between him and the two Michaels. This is someone who had been convicted in Canada for drug smuggling, went to China, and Chinese court alleges was involved in a very large drug smuggling operation. He had the very bad luck. He's sentenced to, I believe, 15 years in jail, had the very bad misfortune of appealing his sentence in the in November of 2018. I believe that the appeals court judgment, which was to sentence him to death, uh, was influenced by the political situation. Chinese courts are not insulated from the political uh, situation within China and not insulated from the party on sensitive cases. I don't believe that's the case for all sorts of minor crimes or even serious crimes. But where there is a political dimension, uh, the insulation is, is not intact. Um, there is, now it's interesting that his case, that he has not been executed. In some cases, execution falls very swiftly upon the sentencing. I think that the courts also are aware of the political sensitivities. Uh, they have options. Death penalties can be extended to a, a what becomes an effect, a, has been a formal suspension, which means with good behavior over two years, it can convert into a life sentence. We will see. As you can see, there's four issues. An ambassador who spoke to a, a national forum on Canada-China economic relations organized by my institute uh, in September noted that he's working tirelessly uh, on these cases, uh, which, of course, are very much uh, within the public purview. Um, I'll switch now to the next slide. And there are external players, of course, uh, the most important bilateral relationship on earth now is between the United States and China. Um, President Trump has pursued a policy that started off very smoothly, in fact, with um, letters back and forth, mutual admiration, flattery in public, in private probably as well, trip by sea to Mar-a-Lago, uh, Trump uh, visiting China. This is, was all sweetness and light, but again, about two years ago, things began to sour. Uh, particularly on trade issues. Trump imposed a series of tough tariffs on China, uh, which haven't actually really affected China's trade deficit at all, which is actually larger than when he began. Um, one thing that's interesting in Washington, there's a large consensus in favor of a tough line on China. It's not a Republican thing. It's a uh, bipartisan consensus. Uh, we will see, I've been looking at some of the writings by some of the people who've been appointed to uh, Joe Biden's cabinet uh, and some of the things said by, by Joe Biden. You can pick and choose. Joe Biden's been around long enough. If you want something positive, you can find it about China. If you want something negative, uh, you can find it as well. We will see. But I, my experience has been that the early stages of, US, of a U.S. administration very often, very often starts off on a very sour note. Uh, but sometimes if an issue comes up, North Korea, um, an economic crisis, a problems in the Middle East where Chinese assistance is needed, there's a tendency to, to readjust to somewhat. That relationship is going to be net negative in my view, but how negative? Are we going into a Cold War? These are un unsettled issues to which I cannot, no, I do not have the answer. I have to touch on human rights because for Canadians and for, for many others, uh, human rights are, are a major concern. And one of the most poignant right now perhaps is the fate of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang who are under intense pressure, a great number having been detained in what are in effect uh, re-education camps. You can see on the map there, the orange portion is that massive Xinjiang autonomous region. It's as large as Western Europe. Um, it's huge. Uh, I traveled upon it starting 1983. Lots of opportunities to meet with Uyghur people. Um, it's from the Chinese perspective, there's a the security dimension, uh, terrorism. There's no doubt there have been incidences, whether they were, in effect, the, the byproduct of crackdown by Chinese, uncertain. But if you are a minority on a sensitive border region, you're going to be under tough scrutiny. It's true of Tibet, uh, which is to the south, Xinjiang. Uh, these are 
arguably, I'd say right now, Xinjiang is the largest human rights um, dilemma or issue within within in China. Um, I'll touch upon okay, right here. I'll go to the next slide, which is religious freedoms. Um, religious groups in general are under pressure in in China. That includes Christianity. You can see there a church cross being removed. That's not being put up. It's moved. There are Chinese churches. Uh, which are supervised by the State Bureau of Religious Affairs. They are tolerated. They print their own Bibles, which are freely available, etc. And if you keep your head down, go to a church, a state-related church, religious facility, be it Buddhist, Taoist, um, um, or Christian, Islam, you may be all right. But if you're involved in an underground church, if you organize in ways that are outside of the, of the state purview, you may be facing trouble. And finally, um, my last slide, um, I'd like to, um, I'm actually going to skip back. I missed the question of um, a couple of slides back about Hong Kong. I skipped through it. Hong Kong has a deep connection with Canada, so 300,000 Canadians there who came to Canada, obtained citizenship and moved back. I don't think most of them want to leave because they went back for economic reasons and cultural uh, familiarity. Those reasons will hold them there. Um, but um, it is a particularly difficult issue for Canada. There's a new security law imposed by Beijing that is slowly eating at some of the unique freedoms that exist in China and nowhere else. Uh, I say China because the, Hong Kong is now part of the People's Republic of China ever since 1997 when it returned to the Chinese orbit. Uh, but those special freedoms, both economic, political, and religious, those are what make Hong Kong a very special place. And then what is indeed my last slide, uh, COVID-19, China was hit hard, Wuhan in particular. Um, the Chinese followed a very different path uh, than the West. They cracked down completely. I have someone in my institute who came as a visiting professor in March. He had been confined. He was in the city of Chengdu of, of um, some 8 millions um, in Sichuan province, far away from Wuhan. There were some, a few cases there. They locked down his neighborhood for three weeks. One person was allowed to go out once a week to buy food from the nearest store and then to go back. Draconian in the extreme. On the other hand, China has created a bubble of almost 1.4 billion people. They have the, some cases that reemerge, single digits from what I can see, and I am in contact with many people in China, including many Canadians and our diplomatic and consular missions. China's basically beaten it. And they're keeping their borders largely sealed, and they're in recovery mode. And in the beginning of the, of the crisis, they brought PPE from abroad, including from Canada. That was controversial and not a smart move. On the other hand, they have the factory capacity. They are now producing 50% of the world's PPE, 50%, and exporting it in torrents, including to Canada. They're in a position of recovery and envious. I've been on webinars recently in China where there were... Uh, People were without masks, no social distancing, including someone from the Canadian Embassy in, in Beijing. The people are able to move around the streets. Um, it's extraordinary, able to travel on aircraft. I'm quite envious of that. I hope to be in a similar position. And China's producing vaccine. They've vaccinated perhaps a million people already. I've met someone who came to Canada after being vaccinated, still, in my view, in a trial facility, but they have the capacity to really pump these out. So that's the reality of 2020. Political relationship, very bad. China, COVID recovery. Economically, economically, the relationship with China, relatively stable. I'll stop there and take questions. But first of all, the last slide, thank you to all of you who have listened. And I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much for that very informative talk. There's quite a few questions in the queue, so I'll just jump right in. Our first question comes from Laurie Schultz. What impact will the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership have on Alberta and Canada? Well, very good question. I think the impact will be China's economy now is so large. Again, number two, but closing on the large, largest economy. I think the impact will be more intense on China and the other 15 countries that are member of ERCEP, uh, sort of an awkward acronym. Uh, this is the world's largest uh, trade pact. It won't actually come into effect for two years. So whatever uh, that needs to have a certain um, 
uh, quotient of uh, signatories who ratify the agreement. But when it comes into effect, it will be interesting. It should accelerate, in my view, Chinese trade, what you would call um, intra-Asia trade between the partners, of course, includes countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan. Uh, I think it will be really important in that sense. It should grow those economies as a group quite quickly. And what's happening, this is a chance for 20 years where the center of the economic, of economic gravity in the world is gradually shifting towards Asia. That was the situation for almost 2,000 years um, when India and China were, were major economies that are returning to that status. It doesn't mean that North America and Europe are going to disappear. Our economies will remain large and strong, but the growth is faster in Asia. If that growth continues, I actually think that Earth's may be a net positive for Alberta because those economies, not just China, but others, and we need to diversify our trade, not just trade with China, but trade with Japan, Korea, and others. I think if their growth happens there, it will be good for the Alberta economy in modest ways, but significant ways if you're, if you're growing agricultural products or you're growing wood and, uh, and harvesting wood. Our next, our next uh, question, well, first of all, a comment from Knut Peterson. Many thanks for sharing your insight on the China-Canadian relationship. And that comment is echoed by Mark Goodall and Jim Miller, who says applause. And then Knut, uh, Knut's, Knut's question is, do you think the election of Joe Biden as U.S. president will affect the Ms. Wanzhou's situation? Well, it's a very good question. In my own view, <clears throat> I follow very closely the fate of our two Canadians, the two Michaels, um, on a regular basis through the media. I've been in contact with some of the family, and uh, it's a difficult situation. Uh, I know that Canada's trying all kinds of levers to get them released. Um, my own view, um, I hope I'm wrong on this. I don't think they're going to be released until Madame Meng's situation is resolved. Um, I hope I'm wrong. And I think, again, that it's going to take some time. I would not expect on January 20th, when President-elect Biden is sworn into office, that there's going to be any quick movement here. Um, Blinken, the Secretary of State nominee, um, once he's confirmed, um, will have very sophisticated views on foreign affairs. It's a good pick, in my view. Steady hands, experience. But this will, for the United States, this isn't the number one issue. For Canada, it is the number one issue. The United States is part of, of many issues. South China Sea, trade frictions, a general American sense that China is gaining as a, as a rival and poses a danger to Western democracies. Uh, there are whole human rights, a basket of issues. This will be one. It's a neurologic one for the Chinese. It's a neurologic one for the Canadians. At some point, um, I would not rule out uh, a deal whereby the U.S. quietly drops the extradition request and imposes a massive fine on Huawei. Huawei can absorb massive fines. Um, China has already, the U.S. has already done that under President Trump with um, ZTE, a telephone manufacturer in China that was deeply dependent on, on American chips. So, yes, a deal might well happen. I don't think it'll happen right away, and it's not guaranteed. Uh, because I think a general U.S. response will continue to be, as it has been under Trump, we want to keep the U.S. The America's allies aligned with us for a tougher line on China. So I think there'll be pushes back and forth. It's not impossible. It's not a sure thing. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ian Hurdle. Recently, I've had a spate of automated phone calls in Chinese. Since I'm not able to understand, I wonder if it is being directed at Chinese students, families, and migrants in some negative way. It's possible. And I must confess, I took such satisfaction maybe 10 years ago in the fact that your landlines, I don't have a landline anymore, your landlines were constantly getting crank calls and advertising and scams saying I had millions of dollars waiting for me in a Nigerian bank account. But Cell phones were not. Now, of course, cell phones are just as bad. And uh, those scam artists have, have, and China has its share. It's, my guess is that it's more likely to be Chinese spam 
than an operation aimed at Chinese students or Chinese nationals or people of Chinese origin in Canada. However, those things do happen. This is not fantasy. Uh, China, going all the way back to the Qing dynasty, has looked nervously at people of Chinese origin abroad, whether they're foreign citizens or not. Um, people abroad helped bring down the Qing dynasty. Um, not well known, but uh, Sun Yat-sen was in Victoria, of all places, raising funds for the, in effect, to help bring down the Qing dynasty. He was in the United States when it actually occurred. He had to scurry back to China. So um, ever since the late uh, 1800s, China has kept an eye on, on people of Chinese origin abroad, and it has not changed. Chinese intelligence um, organs are active everywhere abroad, and that includes Canada. But I think your calls are more likely to be spam, because you get spam calls all the time in China and elsewhere, and I get my share as well. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jim Miller. What advice would you give Canadian federal government to improve our relationships, our relationship with China? Well, it's a very good question. I have, having spent a long time, 32 years in our foreign service, I know a whole um, raft of people there are two ministers, head of the economic and political sections in Beijing, worked for me, our consul general in Shanghai, worked for me, our consul general in, in Guangzhou, um, the director general and responsible for China affairs in Ottawa. And I speak with these people regularly. I will never betray a confidence in what they tell me. Um, but I don't have a magic wand. And, I, and, I, and my problem is right now, um, I think we're in a sort of a marking time situation. Uh, the Canadian public are rightfully outraged by the detention of the two Michaels as retaliation for the arrest of Madame Meng. Uh, on the other hand, China is not going away. China is going to be a major power on Earth for the entire 21st century. Our dependency on, on trade is high. Here are the percentages of GDP generated by trade for three countries. United States, 24. China, 37. Canada, 65. We are deeply dependent. Without foreign trade, our, our prosperity plummets. Of course, most of that goes to the United States, and that's fine. But that has downsides as well. That means we're linked entirely to the U.S. trade. Um, it'd be nice to have a greater diversity. China is going to be powerful. Learn to live with it. How do we as Western countries work with our allies to avoid bad outcomes? Good question. As to what's forward, I personally think we're in a marking time. Wait till the Hmong and Michael's case is solved, but let's keep dialogue open. Let's keep our trade going. Let's learn more about China. Let's have more students learn Chinese. People say, well, I don't like China, what they're doing. Why would I learn Chinese? Learn Chinese because you don't learn like what they do. Um, uh, our, our moderator today, Annalise, is, is, is originally from Netherlands. Europeans speak several languages. They're still loyal to their country. Um, knowing more about China is something we should be doing. It should be taught in the curriculum, and it should be learned widely. It's a question of preserving what we have until the political situation improves, then we can move forward. And we're stuck right now. Thank you. Okay, our next question comes from Trevor Page. Canada's foreign and trade policy is aligned to the United States. How do you see U.S.-China relationships developing over the next five years as collaborators or rivals? Well, it's very, it's very true. I mean, we're joined at the hip with the United States economically, our trade, culture, language. We're different, of course. And I always people say, um, or the same. No, I mean, just because you shop in, across the border, or used to be able to shop across the border, or watch your sitcoms, doesn't mean that Canadians, our political system, and even our values are identical. But they're very similar, and certainly much more similar than those are with, with, with China. Um, if you could tell me what the state of U.S.-China relationship is going to be over the next five years, I could probably give you a pretty good estimation of the state of Canada-China relations, because we are so powerfully influenced influence through our media, people watch US um, television, or read US publications on the internet, or um, simply because of the um, efforts of the United States, leader of the free world, to align uh, policies of their allies. That didn't work as well under President Trump, with an American First program, 
I think you're going to see return to pretty clearly you're going to return to more traditional relationships. Again, I already said that the bilateral is a bipartisan con consensus in the Senate. Uh, the minority leader in the Senate, Dick Schumer, is not standing up and saying, um, President Trump, um, make friends with China, go easy on China. He's saying, treat our allies better so we can make common cause against China. So if you think that things are going to be sweetness and light between Beijing and Washington, I don't think so. Um, I stay closely involved in this, and, and next week I'll be involved in a, a moderator panel to include the Chinese ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Sui, who I've met on several occasions. And when I say had lunch with him, it makes it sound like he and I, but at a table and had five or six of us. Um, but um, I do stay in touch with thinking on both sides. In normal situation, I go to Washington a couple times a year. Uh, that relationship is the most important relationship on earth. It's going to be filled with contradictions. U.S. trade, um, it's not like the Soviet Union. China is deeply integrated in the world economy. Uh, the trade volumes between the two are significant. Here's something you wouldn't think. Despite the bad relations between China and the United States right now, um, U.S. are both from pension funds and from corporations, equity groups, are flowing in very large numbers to, to China because their economy is recovering, because China's trade with Asia is growing very quickly. So if you're a multinational U.S. company, you want to be in, in China. General Motors in a good year sells more cars in China than they do uh, in the United States. And that's certainly true for German auto manufacturers as well. So there's the irony. The trade relationships continue. The security relationship become more intense. And China's getting more and more capable. They're building a huge blue, blue navy. They have intercontinental weapons. They're going to send a, a, a lunar mission to the moon very shortly. that will bring back samples. Uh, they are a formidable power. They, the, the contest and the rivalry between those two are going to dominate the next, the rest of this century, in my view. And let's have to hope that it's peaceful because alternative is horrible. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark Goodall. Should Canada univer can, should Canadian universities slash scientists continue to collaborate with Chinese institutions or refuse to do so as a sign of protest against the Chinese treatment of Canada and atrocities? Well, this is a really difficult, difficult one for me because the two Michaels sticks in my craw. It's such a blatant uh, um, hostage diplomacy, if you wish. Uh, action on the part of the Chinese government, cynical and approved, certainly at the highest levels of the Chinese government. On the other hand, um, we have to be a bit cautious here. Um, we are not a superpower. Um, European countries in particular, are, and Japan, are deepening their academic collaboration with China. There's another factor as well. I'm a big believer in self-interest. In other words, Canada should be always looking to its interests. And its interests include, of course, values, and includes protections, protections for its Canadians, for Canadian citizens, and in particular in this case, those two have been seized. On the other hand, I mentioned earlier that torrent of production of, of um, um, engineers, scientists, doctors, researchers in China. Um, China advanced very quickly. It had a sophisticated, for its time, um, technology, if you go back a few centuries, but it fell so far behind in the... 19th and early 20th century, uh, but they're catching up quickly. And in some sectors, they are ahead. I'll give you just one example. This came from two years ago, talking to a, a top geneticist at the University of Alberta. He said in the past, if a new genetics um, sequencing machine came out, US universities would buy the first year's production. There's a new German gene sequencing machine that come out from, a, these are very specialized things, fiendishly expensive. He said, China's bought the first year of production. Um, we are going to need to, technology is going to develop in some sectors so quickly in China, we're going to need to tap. I know there's deep concerns, sometimes very well founded, that China has engaged in unwarranted technology theft. Well, quite frankly, I'm not urging unauthorized, but we're going to need to keep track of technology development in China. They're going to be leaders in many, many sectors based on that massive cohort of millions of their researchers. And so to me, it's a mistake. Now be careful not to lose what you have. 
and in private conversation, complain about the two Michaels perhaps. But to shut off connections really just means we'd be flying blind. Thank you. Our next question comes from Knut Peterson. Is Canada largely seen as a puppet of U of US in the eyes of China? Good question. I think the answer would be the Chinese public in general has had a very positive view of of, um, of, of Canada. There's a if you go around Beijing, there's plaques about the invasion. They call the uh, Baudouin, the eight invading armies at the time of the Boxer Rebellion. I used to remind Chinese regular there wasn't a Ninth Army, there wasn't a Canadian Army. Um, we did fight China once during the Korean War. Generally, Chinese views they see us. And the embassy has done polling in the past. Uh, when I was still in government, it showed they view us as clean environment, good food, safe, open spaces, nice people. Norm Bethune, a uh, doctor who fought, uh, fought with the, assisted as a doctor of the Eight Ruth Army, fighting the Japanese, is revered as a national hero um, within China. Most Canadians don't even know anything about him. So I think we came to a very high base. It's been eroded sharply by the Hmong case. So if you ask, the average Chinese, I think they would say, of course, they only read state media, um, but we are being, our actions are that of a puppet. The people are most sophisticated in the Chinese government know better. They have a large embassy of missions here. Um, these are foreign policy pros. Those sort of people know that's not the case, that we are part of an alliance. We're heavily influenced what happens in the United States. We're a sovereign country and make our own calls, our own decisions. But for the average Chinese, I would say it's a bit like... I'm just guessing here, but I see a lot of traffic in what they call netizens or, or views with, within margins are allowed within the Chinese. They view, how could you do this to us? You were our friends. Why are you acting like this now? Um, those views may shift to a more negative stance over time, but we've got to still have a pretty large reservoir of goodwill. We're certainly not seen as a threat. And uh, those things that attract Chinese and have brought so many Chinese immigrants away, high standard of living, freedoms, uh, clean food, clean air, generally, uh, those are still there. Bridge City News, uh, which is a news outlet here in Lethbridge, um, with the almost two-year anniversary coming up, coming up for the detention of the two Michaels in China, what are the chances of the two being released? We are looking for a 30-second clip for our newscast. Thank you. Well, I wish I was in Lethbridge. I'm actually locked down in Penticton of all places, which is not a bad place to be, but I'm a big fan of Southern Alberta. My family originates in Southern Alberta. It's been my great pleasure to go to Lethbridge whenever I have an opportunity. In my view, um, unfortunately, one should not expect an early release of the two Michaels. This would be a wonderful thing. In my opinion, uh, their cases are inextricably linked to the detention of Madame Meng. And until her case is resolved, by one means or the other, okay, until her case is resolved, by one means or another, I do not expect uh, that, that they will be freed. I hope I am wrong, uh, but I think that they are linked. And until she is sent back to China, or the case is legally resolved in some fashion in the United States, um, she they, they just drops the extradition request, etc., they are locked into place, which is a, a terrible thing. And my feelings go out to, uh, to her, their families and to the two Michaels themselves. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. Was there an ability by Canada to pause an extradition treatment with a country whose democratic deteriorates to the point of being unstable and is seen to no longer be a a democratic ally. Well, addiction, I hear him, ah, I think I'm getting at you, in effect saying, can we extradite someone in the United, not extradite someone in the United States? Uh, I think that's the essence of her question. Uh, Canada, extradition is something which in a treaty involves great trust, because in effect means that you're sending on someone off, maybe with someone of your own citizens, um, not always, to stand trial. And you have to have confidence in the judicial system of that other country. Those other countries' judicial systems are not perfect, and ours are not, is not either. The reason we really do need the extradition treaty of the United States, now some people say we, we shouldn't send her back, fair enough, but that extradition treaty also serves our interests. Someone commits murder, 
um, in, in southern Alberta, flees across the border. Let's say a heinous crime. Um, can we get him back? Yes, we can. Because as long as the crime they committed in Canada is a crime in the United States, we have a means. And 95%, probably higher, of the extraditions between Canada and the United States will go on year after year. Uh, criminals, common criminals, people who have committed crimes, financial crimes, um, you name it. Um, they go back and forth. There's virtually these will move quite smoothly and quite swiftly. This case is very special um, because it was a thumb in the eye of China, because it was immense importance in the United States for strategic reasons, and of their concerns about the rise of China's S&T um, sectors, including companies such as Huawei. Whether you accept the logic of the American case, which is based on a bank fraud of which Madame Meng was said to have taken part, that is what will be determined eventually. But the extradition process isn't meant to look at Madame Meng's guilt or innocence. It's meant to look at was what she did a crime, and can as well. That has been determined already by the judge. Um, and then was she fairly detained? Those are issues before, before the court. Eventually, the extradition judge will say, yes, she can be extradited. But there are, at any point, in fact, actually, the Minister of Justice can intervene. And it, there's a particular opportunity at the very end to, before he or she, right now, to he signs the extradition request and consigns her to extradition, there are opportunities for review. But if you ask me, should we honor our extradition treaty with the United States in general? Absolutely. But otherwise, we open up, and that will cross that long border. Anybody who breaks the law could zip across. We don't want that. Our next question comes from Trevor Page. On the Monk debate last night, Zhang Weiwei said Canada-China relationships will not normalize until Madame Wang is released. Do you agree? I 100% agree. Chinese have been crystal clear on that. Uh, I've spoken with the, our, our ambassador in Beijing understands that. Um, the Chinese ambassador Song in Ottawa has said that. Um, for better or for worse, and I think it's mostly for worse, the Chinese have, again, for reasons, again, the status of man among, it's not just he's Huawei's CFO. If this had been a middle-ranked officer or even a senior officer of Huawei, we would not be where we are right now. Um, China is a powerful country. We have no way to undo this. Um, they have our two Michaels. They're not getting out, I'm afraid. I really pray I'm wrong. Um, and the situation is not going to normalize or be balanced uh, as long as we have these twin political headaches uh, before us. Our next question comes from Henning Mundell. Concerning canola, we have recently heard that major exports of canola from Alberta went to third countries in Southeast Asia and from there to China. Could you please comment? Well, I don't want to make things more difficult for, Huawei producer, uh, for canola producers. I have to be a little bit cautious here. But I can tell you one tale out of school. When the, there was a ban on Alberta beef entering China because of the mad cow disease, in fact, a ban on Canadian beef entering, and many countries had already loosened that restriction based on science. Hong Kong, for example, um, Japan, um, uh, many countries around the world, in fact, most countries around the world had re, uh, to one degree or the other, bone in, bone out, whatever age of the animal, but for science reason, Macau, that tiny enclave, well, it's tiny, but it's mighty in one way. There's more money gambled every day in Macau than there is nine times as much as in Las Vegas pre-COVID. But Macau was taking a torrent of Canadian beef. Every man, woman, and child in Macau would have to be eating a dozen hamburgers a day of Canadian beef. To, the beef clearly wasn't going into Macau. It was going into Macau and then being re-exported. So it's happening now. China is a, has a deficit in vegetable oils. And Chinese consumers want the best. And canola is the best. It's the best vegetable oil, in my opinion. Science will tell you that. It's the healthiest. And, and, and China, unlike India or Pakistan or some of the other countries, won't, will pay the premium price. So uh, canola oil, uh, and to some extent canola seed, is being exported directly to China. But it's also entering in considerable numbers from the Middle East. From, it's a valuable enough commodity that you can absorb the shipping costs whether these ships actually enter these other places or whether they simply turn around en route and then get re redirected, I'm not sure. But I don't, it's probably not best to highlight this too much uh, because 
Um, would it be would it be better be in a better place if China was absolutely sealed Canada off hermetically in trade? Uh, that would cost a lot of farmers. In fact, some farmers would go bankrupt just from the suspension of all agricultural trade with China. We don't want to go there. We are too dependent on trade, uh, and our and our farmers need those markets. So I really uh, hope that uh, this trade is 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 uh, is um, is, um it goes back to normal levels soon. Um, it, it, the numbers of, uh, of um, the percentages of ex export increase in the third quarter of this year, if you look at the China uh, um, Institute website, they're up in the hundreds of percentage. And pork is up something like 1,500 uh, percent growth. So uh, when China is so massive, if they just buy, start buying a little bit more on average, that is a torrent of, of export opportunity for Canadian agriculture. Our next question comes from Laurie Schultz. Canada Post delivers a newspaper, which is in quotations, called The Epoch, based out of Calgary, which is clearly anti-China. Can you comment on who, what this group is and the impact on racism in Alberta slash Canada? Well, I don't know about the impact on racism and uh, I got a free copy of that newspaper. Um, here in Penticton, I know it's distributed broadly in Alberta and elsewhere. This is an interesting organization. Um, Chinese consider it more than interesting. It began with the Falun Gong um, uh, movement, which is a, depending on what you say, it's either in the broad tradition of Chinese qi, qi which means breath um, um, beliefs, which are focused on health and, and spiritual well-being, or if you believe the Chinese official interpretation, it's a, an evil cult. And what it is precisely is not sure. I do know that in the um, 1990s, it began to grow popularity, often amongst middle-aged and older Chinese who engage in these exercises in parks, etc. Pretty, pretty ordinary cross-section. But uh, when President Xi Jinping was in power, it began to become under somewhat greater pressure. And one day, this was a big mistake on their part, they organized 10,000 followers to surround Zhongnan High, which is the center of political power where the leadership resides. And, and from that day forward, there's been a severe crackdown. Thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Falun Gong practitioners arrested, um, some never emerging from imprisonment. Uh, and it's been a subject of sharp, you know, of sharp um, uh, persecution by, by China. The founder, um, who at one point actually spent time in Canada, resides in the United States. Um, and they published, they have a large media presence. I was in Washington in June 2018, and there was a march past my hotel. It had maybe 1,000 participants. So it's very active in the United States. Uh, it's a, it most recently has taken a sharp turn to the right and become a keen supporter of President Trump. That was not the case earlier. So now it's got a political perspective in the United States as well. I'm not seeing anything in it would indicate racism, but I could be wrong. I'll have to have a careful look at that paper. Um, they have a Canadian offshoots as well. And when I was in Foreign Affairs, then Foreign Affairs, um, I was at, someone on my staff told me that Gong had wanted to meet with me. And uh, I said, well, this group, are they Canadian citizens? Because my view was, and it still is my view, I'm not in government, any group of Canadian citizens should have access to the government. And so I met with this group because they were Canadian citizens. For that reason, I told them that. Listen to their complaints about China. And then they put my name in their publication, saying how pleased they were that Gordon Holt had met. Well, that's fine. I had nothing to hide. I, I'm not a Chinese diplomat. I was a Canadian diplomat. And in my view, it was the right thing to meet. And no one criticized me for that except the embassy, Chinese embassy. But um, so I have mixed views about it. I'm in favor of religious freedom. I'm a bit concerned that maybe some cult dimensions there, one of these sects that's being controlled by one person and identifying themselves so closely with one aspect of the U.S. political system uh, is, is complicating things. But North America is a free, open society. Let them publish what they want. People can read it or not. It doesn't bother me. It bothers the Chinese a lot. Okay, we're right on one o'clock and we have four more questions in the queue. Are you okay to continue for a couple more minutes? Well, absolutely, and uh, certainly. It's, um, but again, keep in mind, um, this is one man's opinion. You could put 10 sinologists in a room and you probably have 10 opinions. 
I give an opinion, but there is no such thing. In fact, when I lecture the university, the first thing I say to people is there's no such thing as an expert on China. No Chinese person would make that claim. No Canadian would say, I'm an expert on Canada. Well, what do you mean? Hockey, the mining industry, canola, uh, the parliamentary system. So, yes, my life has revolved around China in some fashion. I'm now in my 34th year of full-time work on China. But um, China expert? No way. One man's opinion. So, shoot. I'll, I'll take those quick questions and then we'll, we'll be done for the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next question comes from Mark Girl. What are, the, what are your views on the Chinese claim to the South China Sea? Well, that's an interesting one. And despite the fact that I work for the China Institute in landlocked Alberta, one of only two provinces that doesn't have a maritime exit, um, next year my third book will be on the South China Sea will be published. There are two other co-editors. It's a collection of, uh, and I follow this closely. And I work uh, with the National Institute for South China Sea Studies in Haikou, which is in Hainan, which is the premier Chinese think tank on maritime issues. Now, people may say to me, but isn't that just Chinese government propaganda? I say, well, here's my answer to that. Um, when they speak, they are conveying in detail the views of the Chinese government. I have no illusions. It's funded by the Chinese government, and it represents their views. But because it has access to their views, it's a really interesting partner. My own view is that Chinese views are too expansionary. There's no doubt about it that Chinese uh, has some claims to the South China Sea, but I think their, their claims go too far. And I'm particularly unhappy with the building of artificial islands in the South China Sea um, that um, um, go beyond anything contemplated in the law of the sea to which China and Canada are parties. Uh, the US views this in a military dimension largely uh, for the other nations that have claims in the South China Sea, they tend to view it as rival claims. They have their own. China's actually stepped over so many of those. They are in a difficult position because they're also near neighbors beside a powerful country, and they're often dependent on trade with China, and even in some cases subject to their influence. Uh, it's one of those tremendous conundrums. But I do have one view strongly held in that it's not worth a world war. And it's not worth a U.S.-China war. So means must be found uh, to prevent that. When I was serving as head of mission in Taiwan, my counterpart, the head of the American mission there, said to me one day when it looked like U.S.-China were getting very badly, getting bad very quickly, or deteriorating very quickly, thanks to the Taiwan issue. He said to me, Gordon, um, a war between U.S. and China would, quote, spoil 21st century. So when I called on him in 2018 in Washington, he was out of government then, as I was, he asked to remind him of that quote. He said, Gordon, I haven't changed my mind. Uh, and so, yes, it's an immensely complicated thing. China needs to pull back from some of its maximalist demands, but we need to tip to for this one or find a negotiated way out. It doesn't get us into what oh, could be a devastating war. Next question, please. Next question comes, or it's more comments. Um, China is from Beth Mundell. China's dominance will suddenly increase with their new Silk Road, the belt and rail with seaports cap cap capability for super gigantic container ships. This world trade dominance seems terrifying, to which Mark Goodall asked the question, the Belt and Road Initiative, how will this affect Canada-China relationships? Sure. Well, if, if the, this is something launched in 2013 by Xi Jinping, and if they, he'd asked me, I would have asked him to change the name slightly, because here's the, um, the strange part. The, um, the belt part is the land linkages. The road part is the sea linkages. And of course, there is an English usage, like the, the roads, the, the area off a of seaport. But it's very confusing for English speakers to realize that the road is about the sea and the belt is about the land. I would have said, whoa, stop. Quick advice from a native English speaker, change that around, but too late now. This is the largest economic um, and, I would argue, political venture since the Marshall Plan. It's larger than the U.S. plan to revive Western Europe. Um, it is, um, it's very opaque. Um, it's very hard to get proper numbers. And it is, um, China is already the world's largest trading nation. So it is the second largest economy, but they already are the world's largest trading nation. They move more freight by sea than any other country. Uh, they have, again, will soon have the largest 
We may not like that. And it makes me nervous as well because China is non-democratic and its values are quite different from ours. But as a diplomat, my view always was um, to try and deal with the world as it is, not just the way I wish it was. Now, we need idealists and we need activists who are working on the question of trying to make the world the way we wish it was. My focus in my life, because I was in government and even now as an academic, is try and understand the world as it is. And the world as it is means a massive Chinese economy with huge outliers, uh, economic trade. Uh, China's most of its history has not been a sea trader. It's mostly been internally focused. That's not true now. The Belt and Road already sees unit trains that move from Central Asia to all the way to London on a weekly. I'm a bit skeptical that some of it makes economic sense. Building a high-speed rail connection to Pakistan through the Karakoram Pass. Karakoram Pass, if you've been through those, that part of the Himalayas, can never makes economic sense. It tells me that there is a big political and strategic dimension. How will it affect our relation with China is not as intensely as some of those who are more closer to China. Uh, there is, though, something called the Arctic Silk Road. If you look at Chinese maps that goes through the Bering Strait um, into the Arctic and through the Northwest Passage, um, um, China has been, like the United States, a little bit careful about saying whether they accept our sovereignty to the Northwest Passage. The United States does not. China hasn't said either way. Um, so we'll be affected by some of those developments. China's arriving in the Arctic. There are observers in the Arctic Council. They are already shipping goods through the northern route. The northern route runs along the shores of Russia to Europe and can cut travel time, say, between not just China, between Korea and Japan and Europe by, by perhaps two-thirds. Same would be the case if they go through the Northwest Passage. The Northwest Passage is rather ice-clogged. And um, impassable for shipping really means ice of 30% or more. It's going to be a long time before there's enough hardened hulls. Um, and I don't think the North of Passage will be as popular. But Chinese want to make investments in the nor our North. Whether you view Chinese investments as a good thing or a bad thing, will probably answer your question, is it a good thing or a bad thing? We will be affected by the growth of Chinese capacity in the Arctic and globally. As our economy grows, our exports will grow. Uh, but with China's growth comes, comes political power. So really what you think of China tells you um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Next question, please. Okay, our last question comes from Bav, Bav Mandel. China's ability, ability to already vaccinate millions leaves the rest of the world in the dust. Are they winning the PR war? Well, I think... They're not winning the PR war in the West. Western views of China plunged uh, over the last five years, not just the two Michaels, but if you look at views in the United States, Korea, um, Japan, uh, Western Europe, net negative. However, if you look at views in the less developed world, um, Asian countries, um, Middle East, um, Africa, much of Latin America, um, views of China are far more positive than those of the United States, far more positive. And China is now the leading trading partner for so many of those nations. On COVID, they're in a position because of their swift recovery of um, getting, turning this torrent of PPE. And that torrent is also coming into Canada as well. I mean, despite all those heroic efforts, which I support to make our own domestic PPE, if you're converting a windshield factory in Oshawa to produce face shields, or you're tuning up a gigantic factory. And some of these Chinese factories are several city blocks in size. Um, and now that they geared up and increased their production, which now they don't need in China because they've largely beat COVID for the time being at least, these export possibilities are massive. The Chinese already cut deals for their own vaccines with many third world countries, Indonesia, many other countries, some of whom will get a vaccine before we get a vaccine in this country. Now, whether those vaccines are as good, I don't know. I'm not a, an expert. I worked in Beijing during the SARS crisis at our embassy. Um, I had to do things like visit a, a SARS ward uh, with a Canadian delegation. Made me very nervous. When I got back home to our apartment, my wife made me undress in the hallway outside, walk directly to the shower, and then put my clothes in the washing machine. And I uh, 
SARS was much harder to catch, but much easier to kill you. Uh, I think they may well win the PR battle because they have seen brought it to China itself. People are going to bars and restaurants. I saw a video of a party and a gigantic, humongous wave pool in Wuhan, of all places, the epicenter of the epidemic. 4,000 young people, no social distancing, no masks. So yes, I think they may well win the, the PR campaign. And if they put out that torrent of, of um, uh, vaccinations and PPE, particularly the third world, they'll win the PR war there. It'll be tougher for them to win it in the West because for a variety of reasons that I've gone into earlier, uh, China, views of China have steadily deteriorated. The last one I saw, a Nanos poll in the spring, showed 14% of Canadians have a positive view of China. 14%. It gets down much lower, it'll be a rounding error. So that number will recover over time. But I think for the foreseeable future, um, there's a bifurcation of... of in Europe, North America, a few outliers like Australia and New Zealand, and then the rest of the world, uh, with the rest of the world having a somewhat more positive view, not wholly positive. But if that's been the last question, then I'd like to say to those who've stuck on for this long, uh, long lecture how much I've enjoyed both answering your questions and speaking to you. Again, uh, foreign policy is too important to leave to the politicians and to the federal government. We need a populace that is educated and aware of foreign policy issues and falls in policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've got lots of thank yous in the queue from Bav Mundell, thanking you for a profound educational presentation. Jim Miller, thank you for a great and very interesting talk. Ian Hurdle, thank you for lucid, lucid and eroded. Um, Laurie Schultz, thank you, Gordon, for sharing your immense complexities of China and its relationship with Canada and other nations. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of SACPA for joining us. And um, do you have a take home message before we end the session? Sure. My take home message is really simple. And it's particularly aimed at the youngest people listening or the degree to which you can influence your children or grandchildren. Don't ignore China. Um, not everybody needs to learn Chinese. Forget that. Some should, um, but not enough will. But learn about China. Learning about China doesn't mean approving of everything they do. In fact, just give you a small factoid, the U.S. Defense Department is the largest funder of Chinese language instruction in U.S. universities. So it's, it's not, nothing to do with approving or disapproving. I've got so many things I like about China, so many things I dislike. Um, it, it's a long conversation if you ask me do you like or dislike China? I'll never give you a simple answer. Don't ignore it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we hope that uh, for our listeners that you'll or viewers that you'll join us next week for um, the topic of it is important to add uncomfortable truths about Canada's colonial history into Alberta's K-4 curriculum with Dr. Uh, Maura Hanran. Um, thanks very much for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Thank you.